This is Soccer 101 with Moon and Rockio. Welcome back to the podcast. We're just going to blast through the last couple of results, and we're going to get, in, get into the, um, shall we say, the nitty-gritty of the offseason for St. Louis City SC because it is now our offseason. Yeah, they did lose Saturday. Uh, yeah, they lost this, or ended the season with a loss, 4-1 to one to Minnesota United in Minnesota. Um, I guess the positives here is, is Hartle scored his fifth goal for City, his third of the regular season. Uh, he has now uh, 10 goal contributions, three goals, seven assists, and nine regular season games. He was the standout, obviously, for the back half of the season for Rock and myself. Klaus, uh, Klaus got his uh, his fourth assist of the season, but other than that, really not too much to talk about other than um, the score is probably not super indicative of what the match showed. It showed two average teams fighting for a whole lot of nothing, basically. Man, I'll tell you what. Everything, everything about the numbers tells me that Minnesota United is not average anymore because they they were statistically one of the best, uh, maybe not defensively, but easily one of the best offensive teams in the post cup second half for the MLS regular season. Minnesota was a legitimate team, obviously boosted by two games where their counterattack, you know, sitting back and just and hitting on the mistakes of City, you know, got them a a, a a bunch of goals. But I mean, they did that against a lot of teams and it worked against a lot of teams. Uh, Minnesota legitimately uh, had, had had an impressive uh, second half uh, of of the season, including again two big wins over City. Um, City looked good in the second half; they looked better in the second half. But as Lutz Feinstein said in their end of season press conference, still a lot of things to work on, especially when it comes to the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, yeah, that uh, that was frightening. There were a couple moments where you know right backs were just like, "What, what are you looking at? Who are you who are you trying to cover?" Or yeah, what, that one the was there. That was that was one of the worst individual defensive performances we've seen from the back line um, since July. Because I, I think you know we talk about a lot a lot of the times when you see bad mistakes that lead to goals, you can trace it back to a mistake by somebody higher up in the pitch whether it's the center midfielder is one of the attackers who makes a bad mistake or doesn't track back in the area they should need to be in, and that leaves the, the, the back line uh, exposed. But that final game against Minnesota was the worst individual defending effort from the back line that we've seen in the last two or three months. So that was a disappointing note to go out on, but it, it was kind of a punctuating fact for what we all knew, which was what needed to be the main focus. And we're going to get into – what was said at the end of season press conference again, the end of season press conference was held on Wednesday of this week. And it was uh, Lutz von Stiel, John Hackworth, and then 13 of the players. So we'll, we'll go through some of the bigger notes there, but one of the biggest things that we can take away from it had to be that Lutz von Stiel said uh, they, they, they need to focus on the, uh, the center back um, problem and, and lack of consistency. That's one of the big things. In fact, Excuse me, Moon. I'm, I'm going to throw this out to you right now. We don't have the audio or the video yet from um, Lutz, and when we get it in a future off-season podcast, we will play it. But but I'll I'll do what Lutz did with Tom Bogert, who asked the question and asked you, how many different center backs do you think City played this year? Oh man. Okay. Let me think. Well, there's at least there's at least four. Oh my gosh, four obvious ones, right? Uh, four obvious and, ones, but believe you me, that's not the number. I bet it's not. Now that I'm trying to think about it, okay. So let's see. They probably threw Mark Kanick in there at some point. I mean, we're talking like, uh, you know what? I'm gonna guess just as a wild guess. We've tried eight different center backs, and that might be low. Ten. They played ten oh, different my players at center back. God. And here's the next one. How many different back line combinations do you think they played? Oh, my goodness. Uh, at least 14. 20. They played 20 Holy different four-man backline combinations. Lutz also said we had a huge number of different corner, uh, center back pairings, and, he, and then he went on to say, let's be fair, center back is that position that gives you stability. And then he talked about how good teams will use a, a rotation of three center backs. He talked about how some of the best teams in the world will use two center backs almost the, the, the majority of their entire season. So – the defense was a huge talking point just as we hit the offseason. And, and if you saw that last game of the year, that, that shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. So don't worry, Moon. The way that Lutz is talking, help is on the way. Yeah, I sure hope so. I mean, that obviously was our focus from, from the get-go. And uh, 
Uh, I mean, I wouldn't say that was exclusively exclusively our complaints because obviously we've had a lot of offensive difficulties. But hopefully we're fixing all these things, and I'm sure we're going to get really into it. I don't on, think they have offensive uh, difficulties. I think when it comes down to it, I think I think they 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 have a lot of offensive talent. And now the question becomes, how do you put it all in the field in the most efficient way for the overall scheme? Because that was another thing that came out of yesterday, Moon. Um, as as I'm, I'm just going to kind of dollop in things from 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 Wednesday as we talk about them, which was Zhao Klaus had an interesting comment where he said one of the big things was he thinks that they need to work on players being able to play in their most comfortable positions more. Um, as I as I'm scrolling to the, the the direct quote from Klaus here, we have to find a way to put players in their position where they feel more confident to play, and that of course comes from the Houston Dynamo game where Klaus, uh, as he's coming out of the game, made a comment to John Hackworth, Coach John Hackworth, where he said, "Do you want me to play as a six? Because he said, because he essentially was saying, I've been playing more in the midfield and on the defensive side of the ball than I have been as a striker today. And he was kind of making a little tongue-in-cheek comment to to John Hackworth. And so that was kind of Klaus's comment when asked about the positioning. Specifically, he wasn't just referring to himself. He was also referring to Marcel Hartel, and he was also referring to Cedric Toyshirt. Cedric Toyshirt and Marcel Hartel were also available, and they were also asked about that moon. And Hartel said... Longer answer. He said, I'll play anywhere, but he said he is more comfortable playing in a central 10 role. Cedric Toyshirt also said he's most comfortable playing in the hole behind a striker. So when you hear all that and you hear that Klaus wants to play as a nine, Hartel wants to play in the middle, said he wants to play in the hole behind a striker, um, that's a lot of people in the middle already. Plus, Simon Besher is one of your best players. Obviously, you get Celio Pompeu back next year healthy. That gives you a little bit more width as he's more of an out-and-out out, uh, you know, winger over there on the left side. But nonetheless, I think one of the biggest questions coming out of yesterday and coming in, going into next season isn't necessarily how do they get more offensive um, production. It's how do they get – the most efficient version of their offensive production with the players on the field at once. And who are those most efficient players and how do they do it? I'm in a Twitter conversation uh, earlier on Thursday moon, where I'm talking to a guy who, who, who really does not like playing toy shirt, Hartel, Klaus and Besher all together. Cause it clumps them up in the middle. I have a different view on it. I, I trust Hackworth to figure out how to play those four together. And I think, uh, while it didn't work against Minnesota, I did. I think he tried a couple different things, putting those four out there in different ways. So that's honestly, I think, one of the biggest questions in this offseason is how do you put those players? Do you have a thought process on the best way to deploy those four, including Pompeo, let's make it five, knowing that at least three of them like being in the middle more than on the wings? Honestly, I don't know. You know why? Because I get so – Klaus. Klaus obviously is – very talented guy. I'm not trying to take anything away from him, but he confuses my thought process. Why is that? Can I because because I, here, can, I'm still trying I, to figure can that I frame out. the question because the, the the concept of a false nine or is not a, is not a new thing. In the concept of a striker who maybe isn't as clinical as a striker and therefore helps your team more as a passer and a dribbler and a presser, that's not a new concept in and of itself either. Like, that's what we're dealing with with Klaus. So I'm, I'm, is, is it because he's not the fastest player so people don't track the idea of him being a presser? Is it that he's, our, is that he's Brazilian so people don't think he's, he's a defender and they, they want him to be more flashy? Or is it just a classic American mindset of, I want strikers to score? Like what? What is it that's that, that's that's stopping you? Because you're not the only one. This is a very common held opinion among the St. Louis City fan base. So I'm yeah. trying to drill down to why does Klaus confuse so many fans? Um, I don't know. I've been trying to figure that. I've asked myself that question every single 90 minutes that I've watched these guys play. And 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 again, he's good. We all know he's good. Uh, you know, assists, goals, uh, even just a. Uh, uh, having players track with him and freeing other people up. I, he got the I assist understand. on the one goal in the in the game against Minnesota. Yeah, he United did. the season finale. They they got him out and wide I, and he threw a nice little cross in there. He didn't actually get an that, assist, but he because I got. I believe that was the first goal that Minnesota had given up in like 400 minutes yes. or something like that. So there's something to be said for all of this. Yeah, something to be said about the guy. Right. I was wrong. Here's my qu- here's my question. Maybe um, 
And I'm sure if I had watched him in training, I'd have a better uh, answer, or at least be able to articulate why I'm so confused. But it's I think it's because you even lead half the time when you're talking about Klaus and Falstein. Maybe he's this, maybe he's that, maybe he's this, maybe he's that. There's so many freaking maybes with Klaus and how you best play him or how you best deploy him in the system in which St. Louis is supposed to be going, which I, I haven't seen that system really in some time. Um, so maybe that's my confusion because... I'm not really sure what his best role is. So I think the confusion for me starts there. When I take Klaus out of things, I feel like I have a better way to look at the system and say, okay, I want Betcher, I want Betcher here, and I can't wait to see Betcher with, uh, with Pompeu. I can't wait to see that combination and see what happens. Um, so I, I don't know, man. I'm, I wish I could see a few training sessions. I, I don't have the time to do so, and they're not paying me to do it. So you, don't I can't, to see, but, you only get to see 15 minutes. Yeah, I know, but like, uh, I don't know. That's 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 been the most frustrating thing okay, to me as a as a fan that feels like he, you know, likes to comment. Can I just say, is I haven't had that many better ideas why, except for defense. Get back to the basics and stop playing certain people. When you say you want to see a training session, can I ask you what question you're trying to answer? What question would you be answering by watching a training session that you uh, hold on a second? Let me, let me, that you do not believe, that you do not trust John Hackworth and company enough to answer in their lineup themselves. No, I do. I do trust them. This is no slight to them. I'm not saying that I'm any better. I'm just saying I, 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 I feel like one of uh, one of the things that I'm good at, as far as like, you know, coaching and 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 uh, and um, eyeing things, or even just as a fan. Uh, is that you know you, you you see a lot of strengths in people when they're off the ball when they're training when they're doing stuff you can kind of see more of the mindset of the player rather than the, just the 90 minutes that we get to witness in game time um, and I feel like maybe there's a small chance that I would be able to at least answer my own questions I'm not saying I would it, it come up with anything better than Hackworth and I'm not saying that I don't trust Hackworth or even the job that Carnell was doing with Klaus what I'm saying is he confuses me, and I have no idea why. And maybe some flashes of some training would help me answer my own confusion, uh, my own confusing questions. Does that answer your question? I'm not trying. I to don't think it's disrespect a... anybody. No, I'm no, no. Saying, I just... I'm clueless over here as to why I don't want him on the team anymore. I don't think it's a mindset thing with him because he clearly likes to get his nose in on a defensive play, and he obviously is bothered by the fact that he hasn't. You know, rattled the nets in a while. He hasn't tickled, uh, you know, tickled the twine. Um, it's annoying him. Even, even, even. I think not getting the actual official assist because he didn't get the, the assist against Minnesota. And good for you for remembering that Minnesota stat. I earlier in the pod said they might not have been as good defensively. You know, they were probably better defensively um, with the way they just packed the 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 box and then score the other way. They were probably better defensively than they were offensively in the second half. That's why they were so damn good. Good for you remembering that 400 minutes stat. That wasn't, uh, but but back to the, 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 the Klaus point, I think he's probably even annoyed that he didn't get the assist there because it, it got tipped. So he, his mentality is, I, I think his mentality is perfect for this system. I think it's why he, he's, he, Lutz has been such a fan of him and been so connected to him for so long in his career is because he's perfect for the system that Lutz wants his teams to be running. And and so and that's why I'm confused because I feel like this system requires every system I should say requires a position or two to do something outsized that that position normally doesn't do in another system, and I think that in Lutz's system as it has manifested under these coaches, those positions are striker and fullback where you have to do a lot of things that in other situations it's a little bit more simple. In other situations, the fullback doesn't have to cover the entire thing, be one of the chief defenders and one of the, and, and the, the chief propo- uh, proponent for creating width offensively. In other systems, the striker just has to worry about pushing the back line, poaching for shots, you know, you know, you know maybe, maybe uh, you know, doing a little hold-up play. But, you know, you're asking your striker to be the spearhead on your defense, contribute in your build-up play, and be the guy that's there to poach goals. So I, I just think that you ask him to do so much, he does all of it, and yet he and the fans are bothered by it. And, and, and that's why – and so I'm, I, I agree with you. I'm confused as well. 
I'm just confused about a different part of the conversation. Yeah, listen, man, I, I, I think he's a great player, and we saw a lot of great things from him last year when the team was firing on all cylinders and, and doing better. So maybe he's just one of those guys that will – Excel and, you know, like a 2 and 3X Excel when the team is doing extremely well around him. Because he seems like that, one of those guys that when, when, he, when, when he gets a goal, especially like a first-half goal, you're like, oh, Klaus might get two here. But then you'll go four weeks and go, wait a second, I didn't realize Klaus has started these last four matches. And so it's, it's just – it's rough to see, and I don't know the fix. And I'm just some sideline – nerd, you know, wannabe coach that sits here and goes, typically when you see somebody sucking, you can yell at them. You're yelling at the TV or you're yelling at them from the sidelines because you know why they're sucking. And you know why you don't like them in that moment. It, it, that's that's the beauty of being like a diehard fan is you know exactly why you're so justified and hate this guy right now. Well, but I don't have an answer for the frustrations that I have and have had this year with Klaus. I just, I, I don't get it. I I don't know, and I hate it. I Again, hate myself there's for a it. lot of people agreeing with you right now. There's pro- a lot of people who are yelling at their screens uh, or, their, or their phones, however they're listening to us, who do not like what I'm saying about Klaus. And if you don't like that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little something to work with. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to throw a little, uh, a little meat to the carrion birds, and, here, and here's what it is, Moon. Coming up in early December, the MLS will have the expansion draft for the new San Diego franchise. There will be five rounds. So essentially, City has about a 17% chance of losing one player because you can only lose one player in the expansion draft to San Diego. So here's the way that it breaks down for St. Louis City SC. They have to turn in a protection list for players that are protected from being selected by San Diego. Now this, this will be the draft is set for the 11th of December. The el- eligible list will be announced on December 10th. We'll obviously be doing a podcast right around that. If City loses a player, we'll, we'll be doing other offseason podcasts as well. Here is the breakdown. You can protect at least 12 players, and because of City's um, roster breakdown, they have to protect at least three of them. Uh, that are on international contracts because City has um, four or more international players rostered. So they have to have at least three of those 12 have to be on international contracts. That won't be hard. Um, Homegrowns are automatically protected. That's pretty much the only ones that are automatically protected. The other one is that if players have a no-trade clause, they are automatically protected. Nobody on City's roster has a no-trade clause, so no one is automatically protected under that. Just the homegrowns, that's um, Makai Joyner, Caden Glover, uh, Miguel um, uh, Miguel Perez and Tyson Pierce are all protected on that factor. So you get to protect 12 players. Again, three of them have to happen to be internationals. I'm pretty much locked in on about 11 of my selections for the list. Now, the big thing I have, and I'm, I'll go through, I'm locked in on 11. Now, this is subject to change because of one thing, which is right now my internationals that I'm protecting, and this one's easy, Hartel, Berkey, Toy yeah. Shirt. Right out yeah, of the gate. Those are, my, those, those are my three in order. Hartel, Berkey, Toy Shirt. And then the rest of my list is Leuven, Durkin, Kessler, Pompeu, Totland. And now here's here's where here's where things some people might not agree with this one, okay? Nielsen, Besher, and Horn. And then my ninth spot is 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 up for grabs right now. Right now, it, it, um, so the reason why that might change is that I'm not a hundred percent positive. And Lutz was very very casual about the protection list at the offseason press conference. He didn't seem like he was very worried about it. I don't know how the loans are going to work out. My op, my thought process is is that because you have options to buy Besher and Horn and because they played so well that you want to protect those guys, especially because the MLS salary info came out today and Besher's ta- contract is hundred grand or just over hundred grand. That's super cheap, and you saw what he can do if you give him time as your number one nine. That seems like it would be enticing for San Diego, but he's on a loan to buy, and so I don't know how exactly that terminology and that buy option would work. Does Le Havre, or however you say that, the French team or Belgium, whatever the hell he's from, um, I'm pretty sure it's French, that Besher is from, that has his contract, 
do they deal the same way with San Diego that they are with St. Louis? So I don't and, and do you risk that if you're St. Louis? So right now I'm putting Besher and Horn on my list. Other than that, your thoughts on my other names there. Again, Besher, so Leuven, Durkin, Kessler, Pompeu, Totland, Besher, Horn, Nielsen. And I, I don't have my ninth one. I don't have my ninth one selected just now. Right now, I have Watts because he also has a super cheap contract, played really well in the second half, and has a ton of versatility, which is something you want when you're building a team, i.e. your San Diego. Your thoughts on that? Uh, I think that's a great list. Um, I personally – Did you notice who I left that, off? Did you notice yeah, who I, I noticed, left off? Yeah, I noticed who you left off. Okay. And what's crazy is I left off Totland for Vasilev. Interesting. The reason why I'm not leaving off Totland is because the way I'm reading other people who who covers um, MLS, he seems to still have a pretty good profile. And so I feel like you don't have a lot of depth defensively. The way that Lutz was talking, he still has a lot of confidence in Nielsen if he's healthy. And with them wanting to have um, stability at the center back spot, I think the the, their goal will be that it'll be Kessler, a new addition, and Nielsen as the center back rotation. But I, and I think the Horn too. They want they want that defensive talent. That's why I think that's why I have Horn on the list. That's why I have Tots on the list. That's why I have Kessler and Nielsen on the list. But you're right. Totlin was a little shaky. He got benched at a point for Nerwinski. Maybe you do let you maybe you do put him up there and risk it. I think that's that's not a that's not a bad decision. I like that call there. By the way, we're both smiling because I left Klaus off my list. My thought process is obviously, I just said it. He works in this system perfectly, but he's also right now uh still at DP level pay, which means um, if he if he is taken by San Diego, a lot of options lot. open up. That's my only thought process on that one. I think that he, the way he was talking in the postseason press and the offseason presser, he would hate, I think, to go to San Diego because he seems like he's really excited for next year. He obviously has a close relationship with Lutz. How much does that play into things? You know, will it be a situation where St. Louis, you know, you know, gives them. 200 grand in, in, in general allocation money so they don't do it because Lutz really wants him on the roster. I'm not sure, but I left him off because, again, I think that with the offensive depth you have, we literally just talked about it. You have a lot of guys who play in the middle of the field, and he's one of the guys. And, and while he's not the highest paid player anymore because a lot of the new guys are making big money, he's still one of your higher paid player and if he's not on the roster, it opens up opportunities. It opens up options because it it, it opens up that DP slot. That's why I think we both did it. Um, but I do think it's interesting that Lutz was so cavalier because while a lot of St. Louis City fans are stressing the protection list, while we're right here stressing it a little bit, uh, Lutz was very blasé about it. It doesn't seem like he's worried about it. Because, again, it is only a 17% chance, you know, five out of 30, tw- five out of 29 teams that are losing a player. Yeah, um, I I left off Klaus and and again I I think I left off Klaus and Totland because I'm I'm being a little emotional and the last like you know five six matches uh, both of them frustrated me to the greatest extent I would say um, I didn't just do it That's emotionally fair. I I also did it because remember I'm gonna go back just a moment because you said something about our offense not being all that bad uh, just in the 14 teams in the West I didn't so say far, that hey, hold on a second hold on a second hold on a second. Me saying that the offense is not that bad is not my opinion. That is me parroting the 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 quote from Edward Leuven yesterday, where he said, "Essentially, let, let me let me um, grab the Edward Leuven quote so I do not um, take him uh, out of context here because I, yeah. I this is again this is Edward Leuven, not me." We've proven that we're a team that can always score. We have a lot of quality in the group. I think the major thing for us is going to be defending. We haven't done a good job of that. This is a major thing we have to do. Right there, that's Edward Leuven's opinion. We're, I've, we've proved that we're a team that can always score. That's Edward Leuven saying it, not me. Well, okay, and I, I really like him as a person. I think he's probably the coolest guy we got. I'm going to say that I think he's – It's fair. Uh, you're, you're, he's defla- you're, it's a fair criticism. He's, Okay, yeah, but he's deflecting a little bit because you weren't good at either if you really break down the numbers. And let, let, let me – well, I'm not saying that no, in a No, I know. I love like, that you're doing this. I love that you're you doing can't, this. You can't say that you always score if you didn't always score. You got, shut out, you got shut Rude, out a few you, times. People think that my favorite thing on this podcast is when I get to do stat numbers. No, no, you guys don't understand. 
Well, my favorite thing on this podcast is when I tur- when all of a sudden out of nowhere, Moon's like, hold on a second. I got stats. Look what my hair is doing. Look how excited I am. My hair is standing up. <laughs> well, here's the stat. I just, I just did the math. I, I literally was adding this up while you were talking uh, at one point. Just the goals for. The goals for in this season for St. Louis was 50. The goals against was 63. Not great. Defense, clearly an issue. 63 is far too many. The, no the one's arguing that point. Negative 13 no one bad. inside the room is arguing that point. Everybody, everybody who talked about it, from Lutz right. to Hartel to, to Leuven to Hackworth, everyone said, we, we suck defensively, we need to be better. Yeah, so echoing Leuven saying the defense is an issue, yes, that's an issue, 63. But saying that we're always going to be there to score goals, not exactly true. <laughs> we were the – we were the uh, okay, so we had 50. I did the average for just the 14 teams in the West, and it came out to 54.7, so almost 55 goals. So five less, pretty much five less than the average, and obviously the average is not what we're shooting for here. And the only team to have less than us that made the playoffs, the only team was Houston. And do you know how much Houston gave up? 39. Oh, so their defense was so freaking good, they didn't have to score as many as we did. 47 was the lowest of the playoff teams in the West. And those guys still had a plus freaking eight because their defense was that good. But so like, if you're going to have I, a defense that even improves right. a little bit, you're we have to score more. Right. So I left off Totland and I right. left off Klaus because, again, you're right. I'm, I'm doubling down on my confusion for Klaus. But if, if he's something that we can dangle out there and get rid of that DP – uh, uh, money and all that kind of stuff and open up some options, maybe maybe that's one of the, f- not fix-alls, but maybe that's one of the fixes for the gold droughts as far as uh, when we needed to score and couldn't come up. And I'm not saying you got to be the top scoring team of the West. You just have to find that balance and get that goal difference, get those wins, get those draws, get those points when they matter. And I think we can't just take, put our focus on the defense. We, we got to we gotta stay. Um, we gotta stay steadfast there, looking at that uh, at that offense. Uh, I mean, w- what I, our fixes could be. I understand why Edward Leuven says comments like that. Again, the numbers, um, uh, the numbers don't back up his statement. They they can't score whenever they want. That's why they they couldn't score against Minnesota United. And and, and John Hackworth admitted that in the second half they were playing extremely offensive, maybe almost irresponsibly offensive formations and tactics yeah. because they, they needed to win every single game and they needed to score goals to win those games. And so they went gung-ho and it bit them in the ass. That's why they lost big against Minnesota both games. They were going super hard against a team that was that, that buttoned down the hatches because, again, they're a good defensive team and I'm a moron. Uh, they, they buttoned down the hatches. They had City attack. They gave City the ball. And then they would just beat them whenever City would make a dumb mistake, which was three or four times a game, a.k.a. why you'd score three or four goals against them. And so you had to, like, throw everything against a team like that. Again, credit Minnesota locking down and and making it hard to score against them, needing to throw everything at them. But you shouldn't need to throw everything at a team to score when you have so much offensive talent. So there is a balance, which is there's no doubt that you added offensive talent, but you still had trouble breaking down Set it, you know, teams in low blocks, and so that's that's a little bit worrisome. Um, again, you add Celio Pompeu, you add another uh, an off season where all these players can learn together, because as Lutz talked about on Daniel Esteve's podcast, Wembley's game, part of getting all these Germans together is that some of these guys, while they didn't play on club teams together, they've played on youth national teams together. So. Getting those guys having some chemistry is good, and then those guys getting more and more chemistry with guys they've never played with in this off season and early in the next season that'll also be huge. So I'm I'm less worried about the offense. But to your point, one other comment from Lutz. We already talked about his comments about center backs, the importance of center backs. Obviously, everything he was saying about center backs tells me again one of the moves in the winter will be center will be a center back, and it will be a big move for a center back that they believe can slot in alongside Kessler and Nielsen to be the other third center back guy in the pairing. The other thing that Lutz mentioned was, uh, he said, we still want to add one or two positions for for sure and then see what the market brings. The other thing he mentioned other than a center back was he wanted to add speed. So knowing that it's one or two positions for sure and knowing that he wants to add a center back and add speed, where are you adding speed in that second position? Uh, is, Is it, is it, uh, on the flanks in a uh, fullback spot, 
or is it a more conventional adding speeds on the wing um, and more likely on the right wing uh, because everyone seems to be either left heavy or in the middle? Yeah, anywhere, anywhere. And and Celio, come back as soon as yeah, possible. He's, yeah, he's, he's, he's working his way back. He, he was there as well at the at the postseason presser. He's so eager to get back. Uh, he looks like everything right now is on target. Not saying he's on target to start the season, but he's on target where he should be, which means hopefully he's able to hit the ground running late spring at the worst. But I'm just saying is yeah. it, it's pretty clear that if you're adding speed somewhere, you're either adding it on the offensive right flank or – Somewhere on the at a fullback spot, but again, and, and a lot of again, a lot of that could change depending on do you lose a Totland, do you lose an Alm to the expansion draft, or some kind of other move to clear up space. But I really do think the right flank is probably the most likely spot where you would add speed. Yeah, I mean, like you said, it's too early. There's too many variables that still have to happen yet before you can really start to bear down and figure out what's what's going to happen. It's almost one of these situations where um, when I was in high school and st- first started playing instruments, me and Johnny Venus from Greek Fire, we were we were playing in his basement, and we didn't we needed we needed somebody to play, and I was like, yo, listen, I'll get a bass, I'll get a guitar, I'll be good enough at both, and if we find a guitar player, listen, I'll be a bass player you're, forever. You're Marcel if Hartel. Yeah, and if we find a guitar, and if we find a bass player, I'll be a guitar player. And you know, what do you know? We he, found a bass player, and the rest is history. But like, when asked, it was a, it, it was a, let's figure it out after we fill the gaps. You know what I mean? Let's see who we can get, and 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 make our gambles, and then uh, and then we go from there. When asked about, uh, and I, I said earlier that he gave a, a longer answer, essentially because he did say he likes playing in the middle. But Hartel said, I don't mind playing on the left. I don't mind playing. I, I like better playing in the middle. And as he was transferring for the podium, Klaus was coming up. Uh, he made a joke about how if he had to, he'd even play left back. And Klaus said, "Let's let's let it." And Klaus said, "You know, kind of, let's let it never get that far." But the fact that Hartel said, <laughs> Hartel jokingly was like, "I'll play left back if I have to." So you are the Marcel Hartel of Greek Fire, and uh, that's <laughs> high praise. But to your point, they do need to figure out some consistency. Um, it's going to be fascinating to see what the positioning is going to look like next year. Again, I, I, I like what Hackworth tried, and that leads me to my big question here. I've said it already on this show. I've said it on the opening drive. I've said it on podcasts I've been on, and I'll say it again here. I think I think Hackworth's the head coach next year. I Everything tells me if, I, if, if there was a way for me, if there was a market for me to bet it on, I would at this point. I would be shocked if – I, if we get a press release and the head coach for 2025 is anybody but John Hackworth at this point, it seems like to me it's going to be Hack. But again, the fact that and, and uh, if if I get the video before we we, we post this uh, podcast, I'll throw it in right here, Moon. His answer about coaching elsewhere was fascinating, and so that's why everything. That's why this is such a weird situation because <coughs> as much as John Hackworth wants to coach. Clearly, there's something special about St. Louis City, and he feels connected to this franchise because he was part of it from the beginning, and he feels connected to the people who are here who have been from the beginning with him. And so, as much as I say everything tells me Hack is the head coach, it's also the most different situation we've ever dealt with with a coaching search, where the, if the guy is not the head coach, he will happily, with a smile, take the other, the next job they have waiting for him in the front office as tactical director of director of coaching, or whatever they have him do. And so it's different, and I acknowledge that that's, that factor means I could be completely wrong. But I've said it a bunch of times, and I'm, I'll say it confidently again. I think Hack's the head coach next year, and I know a lot of people disagree with some of his tactical decisions. And again, I... I we we're not here doing all this stuff with microphones in front of us. If the idea, if if no one who who isn't an expert can't question a coach every once in a while on a tactical decision, I'm not saying we can't do that. But I'm saying in the grand scheme of things, it's very obvious to me that John Hackworth is a very smart soccer coach. And if you talk to people who covered him very closely when he was the head coach at Louisville City, I said it on this podcast before, and I'll say it again. He was. As they tell me, an absolute tactical genius at the USL level. Considering he's been coaching for 20 years, and considering he's coached multiple times at national team levels and at every other level conceivably, I have to think that he's still a very good tactical coach at the MLS level. Maybe it doesn't transfer, but I'm safe 
in my belief that it probably over 20 years has grown and, ha- and has transferred. John Hackworth is an MLS-level tactical coach. There's no doubt in my mind. Listen to his players talk yesterday. John Hackworth is an, is an MLS-level man management coach. There's no doubt in my mind. John Hackworth is going to be the 2025 head coach of St. Louis City. And if I'm wrong, fine. But I have no problem putting down my stamp. I think that's what's going to happen. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't bet against you. I feel like um, they're at least going to give him. You know, after the off season changes, whatever they may be, I think they're at least going to give him a half a season, um, unless somebody much bigger and much more available, uh, you know, comes and says, "I love Lions Choice and Charlie Gitos. I, I want to come to St. Louis." I, you know, I which I don't see happening <laughs> necessarily. You know, Pochettino just took the U.S. job, and uh, I don't. He'll think be here next month. I can't think of anybody he's gonna, else. He's gonna fall. He's gonna fall in love with St. Louis and be like, you know what? To, to hell with this U.S. men's national team job. I know what I want. Yeah, unless Hackworth gets out celebrityed, um, which I don't see it being likely in our third season here coming in. Uh, I think they're gonna give him at least a half season, if not a full season, to see what he can do with what has been expected to be a building team anyway. Of course, we had that first season and it really screwed us and it spoiled us and it got us all angry when we w- weren't winning. Um, but yeah, I think they'll, I think they'll give him a half season, if not a full season, just to, just to see Great. Uh, for all the right reasons that you said. And I think it's interesting that you said that because Lutz made a point yesterday about that. And he said, things got kind of out of whack where it was like, we were supposed to, we were supposed to have a little success in season one and then it was supposed to get better in season two. And then season three was supposed to be, this is when we go to the playoffs and things got kind of out of whack because of how much success we had in season one, and now everyone's mad about season two. But still, the goal is season three is the playoffs. And everything he said and everything the players said is that if they had more time, they are a playoff team. If they don't have the injuries, they are a playoff team with this roster, so on and so forth. So I, I believe with that, and I believe with how much success they had with the summer transfers and the fact that Lutz now only needs to fill in one or two spot, as he says, in the winter – tells me that they're going to give him a shot with this roster again. And I think there's a good chance they, they win some games. Again, I could be wrong. His, ta- his tactical decisions might not work. I think that they were interesting enough that I'm intrigued by the, the idea of what might go, what might happen as we go forward. And here's the thing. When we talk about the offense going forward, shout out to St. Louis City, too, for winning their playoff game last weekend. Yeah, dude. And, come back. And Lutz talked about how – I mean, how much it means that that game-winning goal was joiner to Glover, homegrown to homegrown. The first goal was scored by Brendan McSorley, who has been fantastic for St. Louis City, too, who is not yet on a homegrown contract, who most likely, if I had to guess in the next three months, will be on a homegrown contract. But you have Brendan McSorley. You have Caden Glover. You have Makai Joyner. It, those guys should be impacting your team off the bench next year. And so that's even more offensive firepower. And when you look at how they've developed over the years, John Hackworth's been a part of that. And I say continue to give him a shot to not only grow with his first team, but to continue to grow those young guys into the first team. Because so far it's been successful for the most part. And shouts to the academy. Uh, I know they have another playoff game coming up this weekend against uh, the town. I uh, hope they get a big win there. But, man, that, that, that goal – and to Luke's point, it was just so indicative about the long-term success, and it'll be interesting to see if Hackworth can keep it rolling. I, I think it's going to be him. Yeah, just uh, just adding on to what you're talking about this season, it's it's back to the plan. It's back to the expectations of what we're supposed to be expecting of a third season. And you know what, St. Louis, as sports fans, we are real sports fans. And you know what that entails? Suffering here and there. We just got such a freaking dopa hit. We got such a dopamine flood that first season that we're just like, you know, pissed off addicts that, that you withdrew the adrenaline from and you withdrew the dopamine from. And we're going we're gonna to level out and we're going to get real and everything's going to be okay for season three. Um, there's a couple other things that I thought were very interesting from the presser yesterday as we move into the offseason. Uh, the Euros, whew, they uh, really do not like flying uh, across time zones in the United States. Uh, all the Euros were, were talking about how, how rough that is, how, how it makes the long schedule seem even longer. Klaus was even talking about how a lot of the reasons that he, he he's chalking up why he's gotten injured so much is 
that the training here in the United States is so much more time in the gym than he's used to over in Europe, and that you're never. And he's like, he's like, I, I'm never in a plane for four hours when I play in Europe. And so I, I, it really just jumped out to me how much the Euros hate flying because they they hate the time zone shifts and they hate, I guess, the the just kind of anatomy of what happens, you know, with 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 you know hamstrings and stuff like that when you're in the air for four hours. Because I have heard complaints about that from from American athletes, but man, the Euros, whoo, they let us hear about that one, Moon. Yeah, so let me bring this up since you're talking about Europe a little bit. I don't know if you saw this. Oh but no, maybe soccer. Son of a. I, you don't want to talk about this? No, bring it up. I hate it so much, but I I, I know Major, it, in the long term it's going to happen, and, I, and I'm going to hate it. Go well, ahead. let's close with this then. Maybe Major League Soccer considering a significant schedule and change that could see the league mirror the European football calendar, according to a report from the Athletic yesterday. The American organization is prioritizing evolution and contemplating moving to a fall spring season with breaks in the summer and the winter. Additionally, the MLS is quote weighing the possibility of organizing teams into divisions instead of conferences. Now, this obviously would be um, not implemented next year, but probably the 2026 FIFA World Cup. Uh, I'm sorry, after the, the 26 FIFA World Cup is completed and would allow MLS to then maximize, quote, maximize participation in the global transfer market. Under this proposal, it would start in August. The MLS season would kick off in August, run until mid-December. They'd do a winter break similar to Europe, then the season would be on from February until the MLS Cup probably happening in late May. However, before agreeing to a new format, the league is looking outside the boardroom to ensure that is it's in its, its best interest. Now, the MLS says that it's completed extensive fan polling, and they want to use focus groups, including the MLS Players Association, to help make the final decision. But changing to a fall-spring season would have commercial benefits in America. The MLS Cup playoffs currently compete for viewers against the MLB playoffs, the NFL, the NBA, and the NHL regular seasons, plus college sports. So they're saying it would be good, not yeah, just sure. for the players, uh -huh, not sure, just sure for some would. of the transfer windows. Yeah, sure it would. It'd be good for half the league. Yeah, personally, be good I for would the, love it. Good, it'd be good for the big-name players. Yeah, and I think also okay. So, get you tell me what you think would happen if they if they drop the conference thing and went to divisions. Let's, would uh, we would we not be flying these nine hour or not nine hour flights, but you know five no, six hour flights? But but again, as but, much? The, but dropping it to a uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but in the article in the Athletic, dropping it to inter, 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 uh, intra division play would be a small part of the season, at the beginning of the year that would decide one playoff spot, and then you would expand to a full schedule. For the rest of the season, so you're only you're only mitigating the travel for half the for a, a one chunk of the season. Um, correct, and you can correct me if I'm wrong there in the article on the Athletic. So, and, and that was a very small part, and and that honestly wasn't one of uh, one of the things I was going to focus on. So kudos to you for bringing that out. But the big thing for me is you can list all the pros to this decision from just the soccer side. Leave out the business side for a second. Lining up the transfer windows, lining up the international windows, makes a ton of sense. I understand it. It, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, the reasons why I think it's dumb is I actually think it's worse for the business side. Because right now, let's let's think, game it out right now. All four major sports are in action right now, as well as as the MLS playoffs. So MLS playoffs right now is going up against, and there's a little graphic in the athletic that kind of shows you what sports are being played. They're going up against a couple of the nights, all four major sports. NHL regular season, just starting. NBA regular season, just starting. NFL regular season in the middle. And Major League Baseball playoffs. Four events. They're saying it would be better if their championship was going up against the NHL playoffs, the best version of hockey, the NBA playoffs, the best version of basketball, and Major League Baseball. They're not wrong about that part. Um, and also, this decision would also mean that a chunk of their regular season would be getting played completely overlapping college football and the NFL. So you devalue the watchability factor of the first half of your season because everyone's going to go watch football and also the beginning of basketball, the beginning of the NHL, and the close of baseball. 
and in my opinion, you're going to devalue your playoffs because there's better versions of play. There's the best versions of more popular playoffs are happening at that time. June is NHL playoffs, the best version of hockey. Even if you're not a hockey fan, the NHL playoffs are so much fun to watch. Even if you're not a basketball fan, the NBA playoffs are fun to watch. That's when the MLS playoffs are going to be good. And then more selfishly, I do not want to watch a soccer game outside the first week of December. It's one of the, I can't imagine what I would like to do much less than be outside in St. Louis to watch a soccer game the first week of December or the first week of February or the second week of February for that matter. Those weeks suck in St. Louis. And, and God forbid, we have what's happening right now, and we have a playoff-less Blues team and a playoff-less St. Louis City team. That means the only thing going on in St. Louis in June and July and early August is just Cardinal baseball. That's that I please God. I, I need something else to talk about during the summer other than just Cardinal baseball. I love the Cardinals. I do. But right now with the way they're going and the way that it's going to look for like the next five years down at Bush stadium, I need St. Louis city to be playing games through the summer. So I can be talking about it through the summer. Um, again, a very selfish breakdown of why, but I, I just think that the larger point being, I don't agree with it being a better business decision. I also inherently hate the Eurocentricity of the, <laughs> you hate that, the MLS. I, I, it's just the, the idea that, well, this is what the entire world does. It's what Europe does. It's what Europe does. It's the same thing when people say, well, this is what the, the, soccer doesn't do playoffs. Soccer does end of season championships. Mm, uh, mm, mm, mm. The top leagues in Europe do end of season championships, not all of world soccer. Not all of world soccer plays a fall spring title. Plenty of teams in the Americas play spring fall title, uh, spring, spring fall seasons, and what have you. I understand. Again, they are correct. I am wrong. The transfer windows line up better. The international windows line up better. You're right. Those would be a lot better. But the other thing that you're that that's in there is that you're screwing the cold weather cities because let's say the trade off is fair. That now that Miami doesn't have to have that, that right now in this situation, it's not fair that Miami and Dallas and Austin have to have 97 degree games in, Ju- in June and July, in August. Let's, let's acquiesce that that's not fair and agree that it's also not fair that New England and Toronto and Chicago will have to have six degree games in this scenario in December and February. Those things are, are would fall out. Both of them are unfair, so neither of them can be used as a cudgel to the other one. The issue, though, gets to the fact that in the current situation with or, or with a new proposed idea, cold weather teams would have to practice more indoors where they'd have to practice on turf, which players effing hate, which means players, if they're being forced to practice on turf indoors, I don't maybe that maybe that hurts the team. Now Miami has another now Miami has another feather in their cap to talk to free agents because up in Chicago you got to practice half the season inside on a turf field because it's too cold in Chicago to practice sometimes. Well now, now here in Miami, Shangri freaking law baby. Not only is it not only is it Miami, but grass fields all day. And so I don't like I I I understand that there's trade-offs. I think the trade-offs are not enough to make this worth it. Bottom line Man, it's a lot of good, a lot of good arguments there, and I'm over here just being like the old man. It's like, well, I, I've been a fan of European soccer for a couple of decades now, so I want to see it do what I'm used to. I get what you're saying, and I don't want to stand out there in the cold either, to be honest. So a soccer game, that one really hit home. A soccer game but on then, the first week of December sounds. Horrible. It's not much. I'm not saying it's better in the height of July, but listen, there's a reason why we as humans have decided that the summer is outside time and, and the winter isn't is because we've all decided that it's easier to chill out. It's easier to find a way to get comfortable when it's 95 degrees outside than it is when it's five. We figured it out. That, that, uh, this isn't me. This is simply human biology and sociology playing out over the last 5,000 years. Don't talk to me about it. Man. Uh, yeah, I was looking up some. I was looking up some of the things that you were saying and like trying to compare and but, thinking. But again, everyone says I don't want my team's best player to not, to miss games, and so I don't care about the other things. And 
yeah, hey, listen, if you're San, if you're the new San Diego team or LA, yeah, sure, I get why. But if you're Minnesota, what the, what the hell are you gonna do? About, like, what are you gonna like? If you're Minnesota, I can't imagine the ticket sales difference. I and mean, maybe not Minnesota; those people are crazy up there. They they have no problem with buying special generators to turn their car on for four months of the year. So Minnesota people are different. But, um, I mean, just just. Like I said, Cincinnati, Nashville, St. Louis, ones that just get random ice storms and stuff like that, or it'll, it'll snow in the middle of December and be five degrees, even though it'll be 70 degrees um, on New Year's or what, ha- what have you. I mean, those – those I, I can't imagine what t- the difference would be ticket sales in a game of, of a five-game block across June and July and then a five-game block at the end of November and the beginning of February. I imagine tickets are going to be worse off for a lot of teams in the hey, cold weather me, situation me, as opposed to the warm weather situation. That's let me ask and again, you this. don't it, my, one last thing. Just I'll, I'll just reiterate: do not go against the NHL and the NBA playoffs with your playoffs. That's dumb. It's a bad idea. Don't okay. and don't go against the NFL regular season with your regular season. You get you get out you get out like you get out at, at week seven of the NFL uh, regular your regular season ends at week six of the NFL regular season. That's that's yeah. that's, that's, that's some overlap, but it's not until things get really juicy. You do not want to go up against third. You want to go up against the NFL around Thanksgiving for football. You sociopaths. I understand what you're saying, but at the same time, there's a reason that those seasons are there, and commercially speaking, more people are in watching things in the winter. So okay. when you're talking about commercial and, and – like, I know what you're saying as far as That's competition. True. That's a – but you're, you're, you're talking about small part. You're, yeah, you're talking about small parts of watermelons instead of 100% of a grape. Yeah, that's true. So, so let's not forget that there's a reason small parts that all these watermelon. seasons – you know what I mean? Like yeah. you want to you want a quarter of a watermelon or hundred percent of a grape? Yep, I like that. So so let's think about that and leave that up for for the stats and, and the math. But here's the other thing too: if you want to, if you were ta- if you're talking about tickets sales and never mind TV, you're talking about ticket sales and seats, butts in the seats. I wish a I wish two polls could be done. One, uh, I wish everybody anonymously, everyone that plays, anybody that has a contract that plays in the MLS, what they would prefer. I would love to see that number, and I, I have no idea where that would honestly end up because once Ooh. I start thinking about one side, I think about the other. But here's the one. If I could tell all the fans that are making your arguments, which are all very good, real arguments, because this is a legitimate like uh, situation. This is a legitimate there, quandary. My arguments are also very selfish. Yeah, yeah, okay, but so – okay, that's what we are. Uh, but – what I'm saying is, if I could prove, if I had the a, a fact, and the fact was, if we change this schedule, we will attract. Going back to the players, we will attract better talent. You know, because there's a hundred reasons that some of these players over in Europe uh, would never come here, right? And, mm-hmm. and maybe one of them is like they don't see it as as legitimate because it's not using the season patterns or the tables that they're used to for their entire life and all the careers of their heroes okay and of course things are always changing and yeah i know the Premier league was made in 91 or whatever so I, you know it's, it's not like we're talking about 200 year old leagues here but there's a way of doing things over there that they're very used to if we could track uh, if we could guarantee attracting better and more talent which would then of course usually translate or hopefully translate into more butts and seats would that be a strong enough argument to sway someone on the fence that's a good question I don't know, but I, I would honestly really like to see that be asked as well. I'm with you on that one. Um, and, and, I, and I wonder, and I wonder if that would play into things, you know, the hope that, hey, maybe this will attract more and w- this will ha- – obviously they're not going to make a decision unless they think it's going to help grow the league. Um, and what we're talking about helping grow the league is three things basically, attracting more talent, to sell more tickets, to sell more commercial um, and the players know, and, get paid more. Rights. If that happens, the players get paid more. So I, to your point, yeah, it's one, to your point, wanting to wanting to survey the players on that question, the higher price players that come in, the more people watch, the more they get paid, and when they collectively bargain for the percentage of the of the rights. One last thing, Moon, before we get out of here, because I need your opinion on this take, because you just talked about the quality of the MLS. Former German. Second Bundesliga defender Hannes Horn, when asked about the MLS, first of all, said he told his agent that he really wanted to come to the MLS uh, because he had friends here that told him about how great the uh, America and the league is. 
The MLS is 100% better than the second league in Germany. On tactical things like defense, it's still better in Europe, but the, M the MLS is going in the right direction 100%. Bang! Suck it, send second Bundesliga. We got your ass. <laughs> Woo! Top 10 Yay. league in the world, according to that one study from last week. Let's go, baby! We got a top oh, 10 league in the world, Moon. We're better than second Bundesliga. Yeah. Cool. Okay, let's hang our hat on anything, I guess. I mean, it's, pro <laughs> it's progress, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, those are good compliments, and you take them when you can. I think that's cool. Listen, I'm I'm happy with where we're at, dude. We didn't have a league a couple decades ago, and and things are shifting, and, and it's a league that has a ton of trouble and a ton of problems and a lot of things to fix, but they're always proactively at least looking it was, at something, uh, and, that's, and that's good. It was Opta who did the rankings of the leagues, by the way. MLS coming in ninth in the league, uh, in, in the world. Uh, City came in as like the 300th ninth. rank. City came in as like the 300th ranked team in the world. We were higher ranked than Santos of the Brazilian league. That's where uh, Neymar was produced, so I, I'm, I'm going to take that as a, as a good move. Yeah, that's great. What, do you have the list of, of leagues? I'm so curious. Uh, I, I mean, can I can if you if you have a, a fascinating story for the fellas, uh, I can get them for you right now. Um, well, I mean, as far as just just talking leagues go, you know, you, you go to you watch Premier League stuff, and there are so many freaking great teams, and you'll have a couple breakout mid mid table teams that get themselves up, battling with the top four, five, six. Um, All right, but then it. you look, but then you go over to like the French league, and you'll see this enormous disparity between obviously Paris Saint Germain and like some of the some of the lower uh, teams in in the ten, in the top flight. Right. So I'm wondering where these leagues stack because so does this Bundesliga is, two really like compete? This is top twenty leagues by average power rating on Opta Analyst, and Opta is a very good analytical site for soccer. Uh, the English Premier League is number one at 87.9. The Italian Italian Serie A is at 86.2, tied right at number two with German Bundesliga at 86.2. So say Bundesliga, then France, right? Uh, yes, and then Spain and um, Spain's oh, Spain. La Liga and French Liga One are both tied at 85.1. And then well, we, I would think La Liga would have edged it out because that Barcelona squad is is getting better. Yeah, like everybody's getting lot better. Of, they lot slipped be hard lot for a better minute. depth. Nice. Uh, Ren, a lot, lot better depth along um, throughout throughout France. I think is what's is what's pushing them through. A lot of great young academies in France as well. Spain's a little bit still top heavy. Uh, so after the top five over there in um, Europe, things come over to this side of the pond for number six, and that is Brazilian Syria. And again, that drop off from those top five to six in Brazilian is from 85.1 to 80.8 for Brazil. So there's the drop. The difference between France at the bottom of, of, of the top five in England is 85, and England's at 88. And then the drop, that's only a difference of three, and then it's a drop of five from France and Spain all the way down to the Brazilian Serie A in six. So that tells you how big of a drop there is from those top five leagues. So Brazilian Serie A comes in at six. Portuguese Primera League comes in at seven, just below Brazilian Serie A at 80.1. The Belgian Pro League comes in at eighth at 79.2. And then you get Major League Soccer, MLS, at 78.2, the ninth best league in the world, followed very closely by the 10th best leagues in the 10th and 11th best leagues in the world, which is the second division in England, the, the championship, and also the premier of Argentina, which are just below U.S. Major League Soccer is at 78.2, the championship and the Premier League for Argentina at 77.5. The Danish Super League and the Dutch Air to VC are just below as well. Yeah, that all seems to line up. I honestly would have thought that the championship would have been above the U.S., so I'm really here. Just I'm below really, it, baby. Really impressed. I'm really impressed to hear that, dude, because I've been to a couple championship matches, and it's freaking good ball, dude. It's good ball. Yeah. And those those guys that are playing for those top spots to get into the Premier League for the promotion, they're playing good ball. It's so fun to watch live because you're watching it typically in, like, stadiums that are smaller than, than City Park. Um the first one I saw was uh, was Bluebirds in um, in Cardiff City playing at this old place called Ninian Park, and okay. dude, it was I am just amazing. You're seeing like championship level ball uh, in like uh, I would say a rundown old or mid 1800s college stadium is what it felt like. It was wildly cool. They play in a big beautiful place now called the Millennium, I think, but. Um, 
Yeah, dude. I'm really that's that's that is talk about something to hang your hat on, like uh, MLS being in top ten, much less above the the uh, championship, the second level in England. That is huge. So. Applause, applause to the MLS in just a short amount of time. It's only going to get better from here, hopefully. And I, for one, I'm all about at least having the conversation of mirroring the, Euro the European uh, schedule. We, well, yeah, we can, we can have a long conversation. Going to be a lot of conversations this offseason because obviously the next big time you'll probably hear from us will be what I hope is in the next week or so or probably two weeks when we hear about the finalization of the head coach a decision again you all know after listening to this pod what my opinion is by the way if you want to catch up on everything that happened at the postseason presser because there was a lot it was two and a half hours of pressers it was a uh, hack um loots and then four, uh, 13 players so we're going to be going through a lot of that audio and maybe playing some of that in uh, future postseason pressers because there was just there was so much information that's why this pod ran long that's why i had so much I, I apologize to moon for monopolizing some of the conversation i know i usually do this but this time i'm truly sorry about it there was just so much great stuff that came out yesterday so much content from these players and we barely got to to really even half of it so there's gonna be a lot of fun here in the off season a lot of great stuff to do as things happen it's it's going to kind of change what we talk about because if Hack isn't the head coach, changes a lot of the tactical conversations that I'm, I have planned for the offseason. Um, you know, if, if they lose a big-name player in, in the expansion draft to start December, certainly changes how the winter window is going to go. So a lot of things are coming up, Moon, but I'm very excited for St. Louis City going forward. I'm very excited for Soccer 101 going forward. If you want to catch up on any of the notes um, from the postseason presser because there was so much that was said, you can just follow me on X at R-O-C-C-E-S-P-N. That's Rock ESPN. I had a pretty comprehensive list, but there are always some great follows around the Twitterverse if you want to follow them around. Um, one of the broadcasters on the team, uh, Jen Cease, is, has an extremely comprehensive list from every player and all the coaches um, with news and notes from yesterday's presser. A lot of great stuff there. If you're a St. Louis City super fan, it will take you a long time to get through all of it, but you will love all the stuff you read. You will be a smarter fan after reading all that stuff. So check it out on Twitter. It's great stuff. And again, as soon as we see some of the videos actually get posted, uh, we'll have those out on X as well because a lot of the audio was fantastic. Moon, there's some Berkey quotes. I cannot wait wait for you to see and react to sweet sweet we're all about being a smarter fan i there love it go. so on the next episode we'll have a uh, uh, more of an info dump for you and information uh coming let's just leave it there man i had a good i had a good time we're not obviously uh playing in the playoffs so i'm not going to end it with a goal we'll just see you next time man god bless be safe and uh you know rock i love you love you man see you dude see you.